Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Gillio, principal here at Homestead High School, and we have uh, the last uh, February video message uh, for this month. So uh, today is Friday, February 26th. Um, and before we get into our, our answers and our, and our presentation, I have our guest uh, speaker this week is Miss Terry Hannigan, who is one of our newest assistant principals here at Homestead. Uh, and so I know because we started in remote learning that not a lot of people have gotten to know or meet Terry, which is a shame because she's fantastic. So I wanted to give her a chance to introduce herself and, and hear a little bit about her. So Terry, you want to kind of let the folks know a little bit about you? Sure. Um, so I'm currently in my 31st year in education. I started out as a science teacher at Cupertino High School, and I was there for a bulk of 30 years um, teaching chemistry and physics and environmental science and also had the opportunity to be the activities director for a season, um, taught teen parenting, a teaching class um, for students that wanted to go into teaching. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and so I've just really enjoyed my career um, in this district and I'm excited about this new part of my career that I've um, launched this this year and I'm happy to be at Homestead. I, I went to Cal Poly slow for my undergrad and so it's nice to be a Mustang again. Um, even almost the same colors too, so it's wonderful. Um, as far as me in my life outside of school, um, my husband and I have three kids. In fact, my our oldest um, was a teacher, Emily Hannigan. She was a teacher at Homestead in the math department for three years. And she, a couple of years ago, moved down to the LA area and is teaching down there. And um, so we have a college student that's attending school online at home. And we also have a 15 year old. Our youngest is 15. And um, she's also attending school online at home. So I'm in the boat that a lot of, well, all of you are in, right? Because we all have kids doing the remote learning gig. Um, Absolutely. And so I understand the ups and the downs of, of that for sure. So I, thank you for that. So um, you, you, your title here is Interventions Assistant Principal. So um, for everybody at home, what is, you know, we know what that means, but what, what, how would you explain that to, to parents or whatnot when they want to know what you do? So as the interventions um, assistant principal, I, I oversee a lot of our support programs on campus. Um, some of those support programs are um, our AVID program, our academic foundations program. I work with um, the 504, I manage the 504 program, although I'm not a case manager for all of our 504 students, but manage the program. I also work closely with the resource department on campus. Um, if we were in person, I would be overseeing the academic center or working with the academic center, which is now our online, to, which is an after school tutoring program. This year, it's all online. Um, and I also with the help of some parents and student tutors. Um, this year, we are running an administrative tutorial on Wednesdays um, from 10.15 to 11.15 for some of our ninth and 10th graders that need extra support, some tutoring um, time on their Wednesdays um, so that they can get work done. And that's also one of the online um, boards or are you working with kids in person? Yes, yeah, so I'm working online in the morning with some of our younger kids. And then uh, just recently started an on-campus learning pod on Wednesday afternoons um, from 1 to 3.30 for mostly juniors and seniors um, that need a, a distraction-free zone to, to do some work and get some help. So I bet the 31-year the teacher in you is excited to see kids back on campus and, and being at least in the same room with them. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's awesome. And I mean, it's why we all went into education because we want to work with kids. And so it's nice working with kids um, in person for sure. So if I'm a parent at home and, and I hear that you deal with interventions, what, what are some ways that I can 
either, you know, get some more information about some of the things that are happening to, so my child can get some support or who do I contact or what, what, what would I do? So if you're, um, if you're curious about any of the programs, you can always email me um, or, or call me. I'll, I'll respond to either. Um, and my goal is always within 24 hours um, to do that. Um, the other thing, uh, a support that I think is underutilized this year is our Athena online tutoring program. And that is also linked on the website. Um, we have student tutors for all subjects um, that are available to help each seventh period. So on Monday and Thursday afternoons, as well as during office hours. They are also available to help other hours too. And they can, can make one-on-one -on -one arrangements with students to either help after school or maybe during a, an off period for your student. Um, so that information is on the, the website as well. Great. Um, well, again, thank you for stopping by and, and giving us some information and getting us a chance to, to know you a little bit more. Uh, I'm gonna let you go as I do the rest of my uh, presentation here. But again, thank you for for stopping by and again, appreciate all the work and it's, it's really good to have you here at Homestead. All right, I, I love being here. Go Mustangs. <laughs> Take care. Bye. So as she goes away, I'm gonna start to share my screen here um, and begin our presentation. So let me get that set up for you. Oops, I just gotta touch one more button here. There we go, looking for the, looking for that. That's what I, so again, so as I mentioned, today is February the 26th, the last day of um, February. And, and also, um, I, as I always do, I'm trying to do a different survey every month. So there will be a new survey. There should be a new survey that comes out with this video. Um, it should also be attached into my um, principal's message on the website, um, but also will be in the emails the, the email that come out every week. Um, please, you know, use those emails to send us information, send us questions, um, send us ideas, suggestions. And again, know that it's, it's our opportunity to have sort of a two-way communication um, and to get to know Homestead a little bit better and for me to be able to give out information. So I um, look forward to seeing more of the March answer. So it's gonna be a, a spring forward type of uh, theme for that particular survey. So hope you get a chance to do that. Um, so I wanted to do a couple of quick spotlights on excellence here. That was part of our theme for the February month. Um, there was a shout out to Miss Amiskita, who is one of our guidance counselors for the students with the last name of A through F. Um, and they were, this, this particular individual uh, were, wanted to sh thank her for her being available to answer questions and that she always has an answer for questions. So I want to thank her for that. Uh, I also wanted to throw a, a big congratulations out to one of our seniors, Anushka Sanyal, um, who has been named as a finalist in the Regeneron Science Talent Search. This means she's one of about 40 kids in the US that is in this competition. It's very, uh, very top honor to have and it's, she's done a lot of great work. And so she's gonna be uh, coming up to some, uh, uh, the finals here where they're gonna be doing some competition part to see who is the top Regeneron student. And so we wanna wish her the best of luck uh, as we go there. So congratulations to Anushka and to her family for that. Uh, a lot of great work that she's been doing. And then uh, moving on into our questions. Uh, first question was asking about um, saying schools must have saved a, a bunch of money this year without heating and air conditioning in all the classrooms. So what is FUHSD planning to do with this money? Um, well, yeah, it is true. We have not been needing to run as much air conditioning or electricity or heating or that kind of thing. Um, there are other costs that, that um, have come along with, with, uh, with COVID-19 and remote learning. Um, we have had to buy more technology, such as like things like Chromebooks and hotspots. Um, we've had to replace uh, computers that have gotten broken or lost. Um, we have had also to buy some extra copies of textbooks and, and materials so that normally they're stored in the classroom, but now we have to get them out to everybody. So we've had to spend some money in those areas too. Um, we've also spent money on getting uh, licenses and, and software that uh, work with the remote learning. So things like Padlet and, and Kami, uh, those are things that we never really originally had used before, but we're working very well, are good effective tools for remote learning. So we, we've spent some money in those areas. Um, we are also, you know, still sending staff out to uh, virtual professional development and conferences. So that does cost money. It's not as expensive because we're not worrying about flights and hotels and substitutes, but we, they still are uh, going to those and they still do cost some money. So we're, I think in some ways, you know, we're able to do more of that because 
it is cheaper to do it, but um, we also have more, you know, we don't lose as much instructional time because teachers are going away. So there are lots of places where we've been spending money. And so I wouldn't say there's been a, a bank account where money's piling up because we're not doing heating and air conditioning. Um, but one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later is we have done like an audit on our heating and air conditioning uh, that that costs money to go through. And we're buying a higher level uh, filters are going through there. So um, I would say, I wouldn't say we're, we're piling up the money there. We've been spending it in other areas. I do think this is also a nice place for me to give a shout out to our PTSA, all those of you who have been donating through the direct donation uh, funding. Uh, the PTSA has been, you know, our teachers have been writing grants, we've been getting all sorts of great things covered. So they've been helpful in a lot of these areas. So we haven't had to spend as much money on some of these things, uh, but they've been very helpful in those areas. So again, thank you to PTSA and to our generous parents. Um, this next question um, was more of a statement, but it was saying, you know, that the, the course selection communication and videos were lacking and that they didn't think that they were very helpful. And so um, I was hoping that that was maybe that they that folks didn't just know where all the resources were. So I wanted to kind of highlight where some you can find a lot of the information because everything that we do um, is always online. And so, you know, it, it, there's a lot of stuff on there and, and maybe weren't aware of it. So if you these are two different pages from our website. Um, the one there on the left, uh, that is from our course. If you go into the, the guidance, you see the black there it says guidance and student support. You click course selection and it gives you all these different things here. There are videos uh, for our current 9th, 10th and 11th graders of all the different courses. Um, there are ones for incoming 9th graders as well too. Uh, there's the course selection guide, which gives you a, a description of all the different courses that we have. Um, there's also instructions in there on infinite, uh, for about infinite campus on how to do the, the course selection input. Um, you'll also see that there's presentations, there's information on there. This other page over here talks about things like frequently asked questions that people have, our homework calculation guide. Again, that's, a, that's an important tool in trying to select courses because it can help you plan what your day is going to look like. If you pick all AP courses and then you add up all the different amounts of work that go into that, it'll show you how much time you might have in a day. Um, there's information here about our math placement. Uh, our career technical education um, uh, pathways. And then on another page, there is a whole thing about high school planning. And so you'll see that there's a lot of presentations that were given to students as well as to parents. And those are uh, on there as well too. So if, even if you miss those nights, you should be able to go back into these presentations and find out. Um, but if even if you're able to go through all those areas and you're still finding that you're, you're not quite understanding what's going on, um, I would suggest that either your student or you reach out to the teachers and say, hey, can you give us some information about what this class um, really entails or here's where my student is, can, can you help me understand if they would be okay to take this class or not. <clears throat> Obviously our counselors are also a really good resource. Um, they, you know, email your counselors. They are getting a lot of questions. They are getting booked up for a lot. So they have asked that if at this point, if you have questions to go to the to their Zoom links. Uh, so again, if you go to that first page of the, of the, the guidance and counseling um, student services um, page, you'll see the place where they, they list their, their Zoom thing. So again, hopefully maybe you just missed some of this, but if again, um, maybe through a lot of the other resources on here, you might be able to get some more support. Um, and if, again, if something's lacking, if something's missing, please let me know um, and I'll get that information over to, um, to the counselors or to the teachers so that we can try to, to fill those gaps there. So um, hoping that's helpful. All right. Um, it was a question about what's going to be the schedule for the week of March 15th, because uh, you may have been hearing that March 15th is a day off. Um, it's not a holiday, but it's, it's one of those things that we have in our calendar where it's a non-school day for kids. Um, and so if you're looking for our schedules, a little quick note here, again, going to our website, if you go to the selection that says about us, click about us then click the bell schedules and it'll give you a bunch of different um, places or things, that, different schedules we have, whether it's a Monday schedule or a Tuesday schedule, you can go and see our, our final schedule and stuff like that, or any special schedules that pop up like this. <clears throat> By now, um, when we have these three-day weekends um, and four-day uh, school weeks, the, 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 the format should look pretty familiar at this point. Um, Monday, there's no school on the 15th. Tuesday is what we call a skinny day, where every single class meets. Um, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are normal days. So Wednesday is our asynchronous day. Thursday, Friday are our block periods of one, two, three, seven, then four, five, six. Um, if you're ever also looking for more information about uh, schedules and that kind of stuff, you can always find, whenever we have a special schedule, we'll list it in the bulletin or we'll list it in that email blast that comes home. So that's our schedule for that week. And this exact schedule that you see here on the, on the screen, that's actually what you'll find when you click the bell schedules. Um, 
this this question asked about you know, do teachers still know or try to give students schoolwork to do on Wednesdays, which is the asynchronous day. This this parent was concerned because they felt like their student didn't have a lot of work to do on Wednesdays and thought it was sort of wasted, and asking us to remind teachers to give uh, work to fill up the Wednesdays, um, and and. That's not exactly what the purpose of the Wednesday is for. So let me try to reframe that day for folks. Um, so Wednesdays are meant for students to have time outside of class to work on assignments. One thing we learned from spring last year was that students after being, and teachers after being on Zoom for you know six, seven, eight hours a day are exhausted and they were having a really hard time doing homework later in the night and they just needed some breaks and some downtime. So the idea of working an asynchronous day in this Wednesday and would say that kids could actually reserve some of the work for time during a school day. And it wasn't like they were having to stay up even later. Although we still know the kids will stay up, you know, maybe procrastinators stay up late because they have a lot of homework. Uh, but the idea was that they would be working on their normally assigned work, um, maybe catching up on some stuff, maybe getting ahead. Um, but it's not meant for to additionally sign, assign work. It's not meant to have a special assignment just for Wednesday. It's also not meant to be, I'm going to assign a test and you know, all my kids have to show up at this time and take this test. It's not meant for those things unless it's sort of a makeup thing. So what that day looks like also, just to kind of give it a little frame for you, nine to 10 students are in class in that advisory, right? So that's an hour of time where they are required to be the space they're in. Um, the 10, 15 to 12 o'clock, it's an hour and, and 45 minutes of asynchronous work. It's not a huge chunk of time where they have all day to work on it. Although obviously they're welcome to work after hours or, or whatnot on that, but they, you know, it's, it's a specific time where we want them to get a chance to work on some stuff. We do also have office hours. We know those are super popular, especially later in the year, they get much busier. Um, but I would highly recommend that teachers, if students get a chance to go into those office hours and talk with teachers or get some support or make up some work in those areas. And then the two to 3.30 is a student activity period where there are clubs and, and activities that are meeting at that time. Not everybody has it. So that might be another time where kids can do some of the asynchronous work. Um, but ultimately, um, and this is going to sound strange coming from the principal, but it is okay to take a break and to not be doing school because this is a very frustrating, stressful, um, hard way to do school. And so um, it's okay that we, you know, we, we kind of did an asynchronous day so kids could get off the computer. So they maybe were doing more paper and pencil work, or maybe they were reading, but you know, it's actually okay to, to, to check out and go do something outside and go pursue some other interests. If they want to read their own book or they want to get back to that musical instrument or just go out and shoot some, some hoops, that's okay. I'm not saying to take the entire Wednesday off and to sleep in. That's not, that's not appropriate. There are smart ways to use that Wednesday. But if your kid is, 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 is like you said, has nothing to do, maybe they're super organized and they've gotten through the work and, and it's okay, let them take a break. Let them find something that they can do that will give them some fresh air. The weather's turning a little bit nicer. Kids you know, are feeling cooped up. Um, I think it would be an important thing to say, okay, you, you know, here's, go ahead and do a little something. If they're not doing their work and they're just saying, oh, I don't have anything, you know, you can check that out by looking at Schoolage or by asking the teacher, well, are they really supposed to be doing this work or could he really be done at this point? Um, those are some good questions you could send off to your teacher. And, and, and maybe the teacher even has some ways to help give some enrichment activities for those kids to work on. So again, Wednesday's not meant to be a just fill up with, with, with busy work. It's meant to be a time to actually have some time to process and or even get a chance to decompress a little bit. So it, it's okay to do either. Um, I, there was a question in the survey about, can we have an Asian parents meeting? I think this came as a result for, we have a couple other specific parent nights or groups that we that meet. One is our, our parents of black students. Uh, another is a Los Padres meeting. We also have things like PTSA and boosters, which are also parent type meetings. But um, you know, these other two groups, the, the, the black students, black pa parents of black students or Los Padres are more uh, ethno, you know, centered around an ethnicity. Um, and so Asian parents are saying, hey, could we have something like this? And, and absolutely, um, you know, we are looking to, to get feedback from all sorts of folks. Um, and if there's a way we can organize something like this, we'll definitely do that. And so I, I've actually heard this request now a couple of times uh, in the last couple of weeks. So I think it's something that we'll be pursuing and, and, and sending some information out to try and see if there are parents of Asian students who would be interested in meeting and sort of giving us their feedback and what they are looking for um, in terms of what best needs uh, help support their kids. So we'll be looking for that. Um, the, 
there was a, a, this question was about um, AP testing and about why, what was the reasoning that the, about behind the district choosing the particular schedule that they did because um, the, the college board who runs the AP testing gave the schools some options in terms of, of how to, to do your, to do the, the, the actual AP test. In a normal year, um, we go and rent spaces uh, that are big spaces where we take a bunch of kids and they do, you know, a three or four hour long test and we have some proctors in there. Uh, and then, you know, it doesn't disturb the regular classes and, and we have these outside folks that are doing proctoring. Um, in the way it's going right now though, our, our, our board, school board just adopted a schedule that allows for as many remote tests as possible. Um, and it, to do that, they're actually gonna be held more in May and June, which is a, kind of a concern because for some seniors, they're gonna be already graduated and ready to go to college and they have to take an AP test. Um, I thought that was not an efficient way, a use of time. Again, college, <laughs> the college board is not the most flexible of, of folks when we work with them, but this was kind of the options that we were given. And, and the reason behind it, it, when you really get down to it was, we have restrictions that, that are being said that we can only have about 15 kids per class to take those tests. And that is extremely difficult when you're talking about testing three, four, 500 kids. Um, and, you know, having to have one proctor for 15 kids, you know, I, I put it in mind, we have multiple tests going over a couple of weeks. We have thousands of kids that take those tests across the district. So the idea of having to use that much space and that many proctors, it's really hard to come by. Like we're having difficulty, you know, getting enough proctors for the SATs and the PSATs, which is just a couple hundred, like 200, 300 kids. Um, so imagine having a, a calculus test where you need proctors for 1700 kids and enough rooms where you can find 15, put 15 kids in there and then have one proctor for each room. Um, so it's proving to be very difficult, which is why we went with a, an area that's more an ability to have more tests that are, we can be done remotely, because it, it cuts down on all those reasons that would make it really difficult for us to administer the tests. Um, so again, not the ideal, totally understand that. Um, but th this was the one that was going to work the best for getting kids to be able to actually take the test. Um, question about, are there any repairs or remodeling that will delay uh, having students be able to return to school? And I can say, honestly, absolutely not. Um, so should, you know, this is not going to happen, but should tomorrow the county say, okay, everyone go back to school. Uh, there's no re physical reason on our campus why that couldn't happen. Um, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, uh, that we did complete an HVAC, which is our heating, venting, air, condi air conditioning unit audit. Um, it was completed in the winter and basically went through to make sure that all um, the, the units were working properly. Uh, so we had to do a lot of repair and maintenance work, which again goes back to some of those areas where we had to spend some money. We also installed uh, the highest level filters that we could, which were MERV 13 filters. Uh, so those are in all our units. So um, that was one of the big things that I think is going to be a problem for some schools in some other areas because they may not have the ability or the funds to actually do some of that work. We've already done it. Uh, so when, when our staff and students return, they'll be coming back to some very uh, safe and, and fresh air units. Um, the A building, which is our build, which was the administration building, that one is offline right now, and there's some work that has started on there, but it won't interfere with any of the day-to-day -day work or everyday kind of work. Again, it's going to eventually be put behind some construction fencing, and there's going to be a lot more noisier work going on, but it's no different than the work that's been happening for the last several years, so it shouldn't be something that impacts. Um, I, I want to throw a big shout out to our facilities crew. Um, they have been doing a ton of work uh, since March. Um, instead of, you know, spending time picking up trash and emptying trash cans after lunches and those kinds of things, they have really been doing a lot of repair, restore, and improvement work. They've been able to go through and paint things that haven't been painted or fix things that, have, that need fixing, tweak things, change things out. Um, they've been changing out furniture. So um, to be honest, I don't think our campus has ever been more ready to have kids come back. And, and, and it's, it looks great. Um, it, it, it's ex extremely clean. Our, our, you know, those folks of us who are here on campus, um, the, the custodial crew comes in every night and you know, deep cleans things uh, and gets it to working order again. And especially with the increase of students here on campus, they're doing a, a lot of work to, to make sure that those athletic facilities are up to, to snuff and, and cleaned and ready to go. So yeah, our school physically is absolutely ready for, for folks to come back. 
Um, last time when I had the, the, the mental health uh, team on here, they talked about some venting sessions and where their kids are, can come in and vent about things that are bothering them. And so they're saying, well, instead of venting sessions, can't we do something about just opening up? Let's give it, let's list an opening update. And again, the opening update is not something that, that I can determine. It's not something that the superintendent can determine. It is really stuff that comes to us from the county. And so when the county starts to take away some of those restrictions, we're able to open up. So um, we are waiting for those lessening of, of restrictions such on things like social distancing. Again, right now they're recommending six feet, but that when you do that, that limits the amount of people you can have on campus. So that makes it very difficult uh, to have kids here on campus. Um, you know, again, we have, we have started opening up. We are getting, we're slowly starting to ramp up the capability of the folks here. We've talked about our academic and activity pods are once again underway. Um, our season one sports have, have begun their competitions and our season two sports are about to start practices. Um, so we're, that's a big increase in the number of kids that are here on a daily basis. Uh, we do continue to do these other tests that are going to be here on campus. And so some of them are on campus, like I just told you with AP, not all of them are going to be on campus, but we do uh, have some other bigger ones. So we are seeing kids come back in a, in a bigger way. We're seeing staff here more on campus. Um, and so again, we don't have a reopening date, but you know, again, if the numbers keep going the way they're going, um, where we're seeing a, a, you know, an increase in the positive things like teachers getting vaccinated or, um, you know, or educators getting vaccinated, I should say, not just teachers, it has to be the whole staff, um, or a decrease in some of those uh, new COVID cases uh, and tier and, and counties moving into different tiers. Those are going to be things that help us get towards, um, you know, where we want to be. But, you know, I know that that pandemic fatigue is definitely there for all of us, but you know there's still some dangerous things out there. We need to be make sure that it's as safe as possible for everybody to return. So we are working on those. We are definitely wanting to get there. So um, you know I, I can tell you that our staff is as eager to get back as you are. So um, we are waiting for those for the more of those green lights to come, and, and I think we're getting closer. Um, but there's no guarantees at this particular point. Oops, hit the wrong button. Um, so again, here, here was the, another question in the same way. Is what guarantees will you make that school will reopen now that vaccines are available for adults? Well, first of all, I can never guarantee anything. And if, if one thing has been painfully obvious with all the pandemic, information changes and it changes frequently. And so one day you can say, oh, we're going to do this. And then two days later, that changes and you have to, to reverse course. So it is hard to say this is for sure what we're doing. Again, we need permission from the county in terms of some things like how, are, how, how distant do we keep kids? Do we have to test kids when they're here on campus? Um, you know, I also wanna kind of address the idea that vaccines are available for adults. Vaccines are opening up, um, but in, in Santa Clara County, vaccines for teachers and educators don't start until after this video is out, right? So it opens up after the 28th. So we haven't even begun to get a lot of our folks. Although some of us like me, I live in a different county. And so I've actually already started to get vaccinated. So there are some of us who are starting to get vaccinated, um, but it is not easy to get, if you've been in anybody that's tried to get on there, um, it is, it is definitely hard. Um, you know, that, that it, you don't just jump on and get immediately what you want, but then you have to go through two different doses and there's a time where it gets there. So it's going to take a little bit of time to get people there. So again, getting people vaccinated though, will be a, a big step in helping us uh, get the school open. So uh, definitely Glad to see that those are starting to happen. Glad to see that Alameda, Alameda County has already started to, uh, to, to vaccinate um, educators. Glad to see that Santa Clara is about to open up for it. Santa Cruz County is also about to open up because a lot of our teachers live in, in, and educators all live in those three different areas. So um, that would be super important for us. I do want to remind you though, that we have made an agreement uh, to, to be on remote learning until April 9th. And so again, if we start doing, continuing doing the planning we're doing right now, we could see a significant you know, improvement in our situation. You know, if we get to red tier, we could possibly be the orange tier by then. We could have most, if not all of our, our educators vaccinated. So again, that's gonna give us some time to then have our last couple of months of school where we could be looking at some return to school in that regard. So again, what that's gonna look like, that still remains to be seen, but the, the, I, sitting here today right now with the way things are looking, that's what it feels like to me. So I'm not the one that gets to say that we are doing it, but I'm saying that that feels a lot better than we were even three weeks ago. Um, and so, but we are still having those conversations as a district about what are some of the reopening possibilities you know, that are safe and are meaningful. 
Um, so we, again, safety is going to be number one. Everyone's going to be concerned about that. So we have to make sure they're safe. We also have to make sure that we're not moving into a situation where we're going to be providing, even though it's in person, something that's less or worse than what remote learning is. So we need to really look at that. And so that's going to be part of our conversation that we will have over these next couple of months. And we're looking at what other folks are looking at as well, too. So um, hoping to, to have some more positive uh, reports on that in the next coming week. So. So important dates. We have a bunch here coming up in March, going to be sort of a busy time, but um, this Friday today is the end of the grading period. So progress reports will be coming out pretty soon. So there are three grading periods in each semester. First two have progress reports. That's just a snapshot, just kind of shows you what they're doing, kids are doing at the particular moment, uh, and then the final grade at the end of the semester. So those are the, the first grading period for this semester is, is just about to end. Um, on March 3rd, there is an in-person SAT for juniors. Again, that's, you should have already signed up for that. Um, that's already full, so you, there's no space at this time anyway, but just know that that's, um, you know, that's coming up. Um, our topic for our advisory on March 3rd is going to be disability awareness. Um, it was put together by our resource special ed department uh, across the district, and so looking forward to having that conversation with our students. Um, you'll see a lot of things in here about upcoming um, junior college nights. So uh, March 10th, there is the Foothill College application workshop. Um, again, March 15th, they talked about that already. That's a no school day and, and they have a special schedule the rest of the week. Uh, the 16th is the De Anza application workshop. The 18th is district-wide community college night. Uh, I highlighted March 23rd, which is the uh, Homestead site board meeting. Uh, that's always a fun event. They're going to be online again this year. We didn't get to do one last year because of the school closures, but um, this is a chance where we get to celebrate our, our retiring teachers, um, to, to highlight some of our fantastic students and some of the great work that our staff has been doing, um, as well as a chance to, to really uh, showcase the great stuff that's happening even in remote learning here. Um, so mark your calendars for March 23rd. And then finally on the 24th, there's both the Mission College Orientation Workshop and a College Information Night for parents and juniors. So a lot of, if you, again, for, to get more information about these particular events, go to our, our website. You can go to our guidance counselor, guidance counseling site. You'll see a lot of these uh, on the calendar there. You'll see them on our, our, our events calendar, um, or you'll see write-ups about them in the bulletin. Uh, so again, wanted to thank you all for coming this week and thank uh, Terry Hannigan for being our guest speaker. Um, our new survey is coming out, so please take a look at that. Please fill that out. Uh, and again, you continue to stay safe. Thank you for all your submissions for the month of February, and we look forward to seeing what March brings us. Thank you. Take care.